I've been watching the news and I wanted to better understand the pro-Palestinian movement that's taking place at many of our major universities. Our college kids want Israel to immediately stop all attacks in the Middle East, especially their attacks on the Palestinian people, which equates to genocide in their eyes. They want Israel to be held to account for all the perceived atrocities done to the Palestinian people for the past 75 years. They want the Israelis to vacate all occupied land that they seized during the 1967 Six-Day War. They want their colleges to completely divest in any business entity or person that does business directly or indirectly with these perceived Zionists. And the funding of the pro-Palestinian movement has come from high-level democratic sources like Soros, Rockefeller, and Prisker, to name a few. But the pressing question is, how did we get to this point? I wanted to understand every facet of the Israeli, Palestinian, and its neighbors conflict. No source could factually teach me more about the tumultuous relationship between these two foes than President Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. Americans don't want to know. And um, many Israelis don't want to know what um, is going on inside Palestine. It, it's, a, it's a terrible human rights persecution that is far transcends what any outsider would imagine. And there are powerful political forces in America that prevents any objective analysis of the problem in the Holy Land. Uh, I think it's accurate to say that, that not, not a single member of Congress with, which I, with whom I'm familiar would possibly speak out and um, call for Israel to withdraw to their legal boundaries or to um, publicize the plight of the Palestinians. Palestine, peace, not apartheid. Since 1973, President Carter and his wife Rosalind have dedicated their lives to humanity and peace in the Middle East. The Carter Center has an open branch office in the Middle East today. I remember back in elementary school when President Carter first became president. My teacher was talking about how religious our 39th president was. And out of the blue, she asked me, what do you think? I said, well, he has the same initials as Jesus Christ. If you could chronicle President Carter's life before he took office, you would conclude that he wanted to see the Israelis as being fair and just, all because of their biblical status of being God's chosen people. As President Carter saw and learned about what was really going on, it serves as proof that he was not only a man that believed in God, but he also believed God. Thus, he wrote his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. Let's take a look at the polarizing word apartheid used in the title of his book. History has it that this land has always belonged to the Palestinians. At one time, the Jews were there, but they scattered, they left. Diaspora, apartheid is when native people of a land is denied access to their land and use of their land by outsiders, usually by force. Remember the Trail of Tears from our history? What an eloquently written book. In his book, President Carter gave succinct historical accounts of the Palestinians and the Israelis. He discussed so many leaders, policymakers, rulers, and even small players in situations that had important outcomes. He gave exact quotes and attached the applicable reference materials. Now this is my take on the book. Did President Carter know that his battle to achieve peace 
considering the way things have been done for the past 50 years or so, that achieving peace was a losing cause. And he was pointing the finger at Israel, God's chosen people, with overwhelming proof. So after reading the book two times, I could clearly see a pattern of certain things that kept coming up. UN Resolution 242, UN Resolution 338, Camp David Accords, the Oslo Agreement, non-compliance and defiance, skirmishes, then war, loss of land, power, and freedoms. And it all starts again. So with the knowledge gained from reading President Carter's book, deductive reasoning and common sense it's crystal clear what got us to the point where pro-Palestinian movements are taking place on our college campuses. UN Resolution 181. In November of 1947, the UN laid out a plan that would make Israel an independent nation. The plan was to do the same thing for the people of Palestine, but at a later date, in this shared territory. At that time, the land was called British Palestine. May 11, 1949, the UN made Israel a sovereign country. In doing so, the UN clearly defined Israel's borders. During the Six Day War in June of 1967, Israel seized 70,000 square miles of land from the Palestinians and a coalition of neighboring Arab nations. And then comes UN Resolution 242, which calls for withdrawals of Israeli troops from the occupied territories. 242 still recognized Israel as a sovereign nation with a right to protect itself. Since 1967, all subsequent resolutions, talks, Accords and agreements have clearly defined the problem, which is Israel. Give the people their land back, and until this very day, Israel hasn't given back one inch of the land that they have taken by way of war, attacks, or skirmishes. But doesn't the Bible say? that the spoils of war go to the victor. But is it truly a war if you are so dominant? We all know what the UN can give. But the question is, what can the UN take away? UN Resolution 242, 338, and so on. The Camp David Accords, the Oslo Agreement, and on and on. Not one of these resolutions or agreements have given a well-defined and organized timeline of when the occupied land in this territory should be given back. The sad point now is, is that Israel is so dominant and powerful that they are truly indifferent. I learned in elementary school that sometimes you have to match the bully's aggression and force to make him or her back down. In closing, I want you guys to strongly consider the information in my video and look at four political plays at the end of the Obama administration. In 2014, Russia invaded the Ukraine. In 2016, Russia hacked the DNC. About the same time, Obama didn't vote in the UN for Israel. In 2015, the Iran nuclear deal netted Iran $150 billion. The stage is set. Get your popcorn ready. <laughs>